Good morning, everyone. It's a, uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here. And um, I'd first like to express um, uh, my gratitude and appreciation to the, uh, to the whole uh, UNU wider team, but in particular to Yong Fu for, for, um, for enabling me to be here and to share some thoughts uh, with you uh, today. Uh, let me just first uh, preface uh, my, my remarks today by uh, saying that um, this presentation in no way is meant to be sort of a comprehensive uh, presentation of all of the uh, uh, work, both analytical and investment, that the World Bank, being a large institution, uh, does um, in the area of uh, green cities. I did, though, of course, want to uh, give you a flavor of some of the work um, that we do do, uh, more on the analytical and the normative side, and uh, also to, uh, to, to, but also just to sort of open up the space for discussion, so to present some thoughts that um, uh, my team and I, um, working on cities and climate change and on sustainable cities in general, uh, have been thinking about uh, in recent years and uh, to, yeah, to engage with, uh, with you on, on a discussion on some of these issues. So uh, just, just in terms of background and setting the context, um, especially since I'm the first presenter, uh, the, just, I think um, as, as all of you probably well know, um, you know urban is, our planet is becoming increasingly urbanized. Um, we've heard many times in recent years that uh, for the first time in human history, uh, more than half of us, more than half of humanity now lives uh, in, in urban areas. It's, it's never been like this uh, before. And uh, just, just an example um, from, from, from China, from, from the Pearl River Delta, um, you've got the area of Shenzhen, uh, where 30 years ago it was um, not you know, a city, and today it's, it, it's built up. And in fact, it's part of a very, very large um, um, urban conurbation. Globally, if you then think about what, you know, sort of the trends and the projections uh, uh, for the next few decades, Africa is really the next frontier for urbanization. Um, Latin America and increasingly uh, many parts of Asia are, are, are quite urbanized. Um, Africa has relatively low urbanization rates currently, but that's the next wave. Um, and what you see here um, are just some of the um, analysis we've done in-house um, uh, for a number of African cities. Um, this one I, I'm just showing here is um, Nairobi. Um, I apologize if you're not able to see very clearly the bottom half of the slide, but that's actually just the uh, sort of the GIS analysis based on some of the satellite images um, from the year 2000 then 2010, and then the projection to 2030 of the built-up area um, of, of Nairobi. One of the key messages, though, um, which we do uh, communicate, um, particularly to uh, those of us who don't actually work um, in, 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 in urban, um, is really to understand that cities are drivers of economic growth and prosperity. Um, for a long time, uh, you know, there has been a lot of, so a lot of the conventional thinking was about how urban poverty um, is, is driven by, you know, increasing cities, that rural urban migration um, is, is a bad thing. But um, I think the World Development Report, uh, 2009, uh, and uh, other recent work actually has tried to sort of shift the paradigm and to say that, well, uh, there are many, many benefits from the agglomeration economies that cities provide. And so this slide, uh, uh, here shows us um, one of the figures from WDR, just showing this sort of correlation, if you will, between um, urbanization and uh, income. Uh, one of the more recent reports by McKinsey, um, just out um, recently, uh, also gives some numbers, which I've just added onto the bottom of the slide, on the, uh, the, the percentage of national GDP, um, which is generated in urban areas. And um, I think the estimate um, is something like uh, globally about 60%, but for some of the largest, um, I think five or 600 cities, it's as high as 80% um, of, of GDP, which is generated in these urban areas. Now, coming to sort of the core of the uh, discussion for this uh, conference, um, and I think, again, this message, uh, I, I think I feel sometimes I'm preaching to the choir or to the converted um, about how important cities are for, for climate change and particularly for mitigating climate change. Um, you know, just based on the uh, IEA um, sort of calculations from a couple of years ago, um, we do know um, fairly confidently that uh, at least two thirds of global energy consumption are attributable to cities. If you then include the embodied emissions, food, water, uh, so on and so forth, of, of, of all of the uh, activity which goes on in cities and which has teleconnections to areas outside of cities, um, we think that um, as much as 80% of global emissions are ultimately attributable to the residents um, of cities. 
then if you put this uh, then uh, so if you compare this uh, or you, you put this together with the sort of the, the broader context of you know urbanization trends um, globally uh, and and just the sort of the pace of development and, and urbanization and investment actually in infrastructure in buildings um, etc in cities uh, this becomes actually a very very urgent message and uh, to put it very pithily in a sort of a more dramatic phase, uh, the, so the battle against climate change um, will largely be won or lost in the cities. It, it, in other words, what we do in our cities in the coming decades will really determine um, to a large extent um, what we're able to do uh, for global climate change. Having said that, when you're working with cities, when um, you're a mayor or a city administrator or a city level decision maker or a practitioner, um, you're faced with very, very practical um, issues and challenges of the day. Uh, when we do speak um, with, with city officials, um, they'll say oftentimes, especially in developing countries, especially in sort of smaller and medium sized cities, um, they'll say, don't come and talk to me about climate change. Um, you know, that's probably number 23 on my list because I have 22 other urgent things which I need to attend to today. And um, I think that speaks um, very well to some of what we heard in the opening plenary um, this morning about the trade-offs, about the relative priorities, and about how we can work with uh, local governments, sub-national governments, um, on you know, very sort of practical and uh, pragmatic uh, solutions. So now I wanted to show you uh, a number of, uh, of slides um, of, of basically numbers or, or, or data, um, just, again, just to give you a sense of, um, of, of what some of the numbers um, are looking at. Um, this slide actually, uh, sort of vertical axis is uh, CO2 emissions um, per capita um, over time. And then um, the horizontal axis is um, urban population as a percentage of the national population. And the bubble size um, is the uh, total carbon dioxide emissions of the, uh, of the country. And what we did was we plotted this over time. And so you see for a number of countries, so the US, for example, um, you know, has always been a high emitter, um, both in terms of total national emissions, the bubble size, but also uh, per, per capita, you, you see um, up there. Uh, but then. You'll see some other countries, and it's, uh, it's quite interesting. Sweden is actually the little one um, further to the right, um, which has always been, well, it's a relatively small country and has um, relatively low uh, per capita emissions. But I think what's interesting to see is uh, the developing countries and the large developing countries, um, Brazil, China, India, for example, where you see this, um, th this growth in the per, cap per capita emissions, um, and I think we know that quite well. You see the growth in the total emissions um, as well. And um, what's interesting, you see a country like um, Brazil or the Republic of Korea, uh, South Korea, which is um, those smaller bubbles and goes, kind of goes there towards the, the end of the slide. Um, that's actually sort of how this, you know, the countries have urbanized um, over time. This graph has um, sort of had a long life. Um, it's existed in, in, in various forms, actually, I should say, um, for at least more than a decade now. I was actually sort of digging through the data and going back and, 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 and seeing, because you'll see different versions of this. Uh, but I think it's, it, it, it's quite robust, actually, uh, just in terms of the, 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 the relationship you do see um, between um, urban form and, um, and, and density and uh, the uh, the energy emission, uh, energy consumption, and therefore uh, the the emissions. What you do have on the vertical um, axis here, though, are the indivi individual emissions um, from from transport, not the overall um, emissions. And the message of this slide, and again, this uh, this diagram and this analysis um, from uh, um, Alain Bateau and others, uh, has been around for, for for quite a while. But the the point of this really is that sort of you know when you invest in cities you lock in uh, urban form for decades or even a century scale. Uh, and I think this is a particularly important message that the investment decisions we take today um, are, you know, will, will, inf you know, will, will influence the emissions pathways um, for, for very long decades into the future. And uh, particularly in places like China, which are urbanizing um, really fast, um, this has very serious implications. Um, if you look back, though, at um, cities in what well, I, I could call, I guess, the global north, uh, this actually just sort of gives more evidence that, you know, 
your decisions that you might be able to take today are actually limited or, or constrained by the d decisions in the past, um, just how you've built up. So American, many American cities, um, in this case you see here Atlanta, um, really it, it, it's difficult actually to change the pattern of sprawl, to change how people live, um, just because of how things have been built up, you know, in Los Angeles, um, even Washington DC, um, etc. I like that. And by contrast, you, you just look at the built up area of Barcelona, which is actually more or less the same number of people. This is um, fresh off the press, or I should say it's actually forthcoming because we haven't published it yet, but it's coming out uh, shortly um, in this new paper that we're calling Towards a Partnership for Sustainable Cities. And here what we've done is we've plotted uh, on the horizontal axis GDP per capita for cities, right? And then the vertical axis GHG emissions per capita for cities. Uh, and what you see there, um, where we put it in bold and in capital letters, uh, are, the, uh, are, are the numbers for which we have the peer-reviewed metropolitan level data. And I'll get to this again on, um, on, in a subsequent slide um, about just how we measure GHG emissions um, from uh, cities. Uh, because uh, I don't want to get into it too much for it now, but um, because there are actually many different methodologies by which um, cities are actually measuring and reporting their emissions. So uh, the ones in, in the sort of uh, non-bold or lowercase and not capitalized are the ones where they're not actually um, um, fully peer reviewed. But um, what you see here then, are, you know, you can sort of divide it into four quadrants. And what we've done is, you know, the green line there is, oh, I only have two minutes left. Okay, I'm going to accelerate. Um, the green line there is sort of the high income um, classification according to the World Bank, which we usually apply to countries. And then 550 parts per million um, is there again, sort of the, you know, what, our, what do our cap global per capita emissions need to be to keep us uh, below um, 550. And it's not very good news actually, because you see, you know, this, uh, this slope this way, and many, many of our cities are um, in the upper right hand quadrant. And if you want to look at the bottom right hand quadrant, which is where we would like to be, um, there are actually very, very few cities um, who are sort of in that quadrant with, with you know, relatively high income levels and low emissions. So I need to accelerate now, show you again uh, some of the sectoral analysis of GHG emissions from selected cities. Um, the point of this slide actually, or the point of this analysis is to say that if you're able to analyze the city's greenhouse gas emissions, you're able to look at sort of the sectoral breakdown, that helps you to prioritize actually you know, your efforts um, for mitigation. This um, is sort of one of the latest uh, sort of advances um, internationally in terms of international standard um, for city greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we've been working in this space um, for a few years now um, with a number of partners, UNEP, UN Habitat, uh, World Resources Institute, uh, C40 and ICLE, uh, because of the, what we would call a sort of a proliferation of sort of different uh, methodologies uh, for uh, calculating uh, city uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So um, the latest advance in this space was uh, the GPC, which was actually um, announced and launched uh, more recently at Rio Plus 20. And I just sort of pasted there on the left, um, sort of the, the reporting table actually, um, which the city of Rio de Janeiro um, has according to this new protocol. But I'd say the, the, the important thing uh, before I move on, and I realize I actually only have one minute left, um, is that uh, the, it, it's really important that we do actually have this owned and rolled out by um, organizations and networks of cities like ICLE and C40. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. I'm not going to talk to it too much, except to say that then if you're looking um, at mitigation efforts um, within the city, there are obviously the number of sectors and there are obviously all sorts of things you can do here. And, and you know, this is just sort of a, an analytic diagram about um, and where these efforts might be and what they might be. I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, I'm not going to talk to it too much, except to say that um, we've also been working in, um, in on the question of carbon finance for cities. Uh, again, I, I think you're well aware that um, sort of the, the current problem with the carbon markets actually is just sort of the, you know the limited demand and, and the low prices, so on and so forth. But uh, if you look at uh, registered CDM um, 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 projects so far, one of the challenges for cities has just been the high transaction costs. And this approach, um, which is working across multiple sectors, uh, has been trying to overcome that, um, um, that problem. Uh, this is an example of a tool, uh, that one of the tools um, that we have with, the, with SMAPS, the Energy Sector Management and Assistance Program. Now, um, I think it's rather unfortunate that um, because of the constraints of time, I'm not able to go in um, sort of into detail on the adaptation side of things. So let me skip a couple of these slides again, which you well know. 
Uh, this one I do want to talk to for a little bit. Uh, two years ago, the World Bank did um, a study on the economics of adaptation to climate change. It came up with some big sort of headline numbers. Um, There's quite a lot of talk about sort of the approach uh, that which was taken and how these numbers were arrived at. Um, but the point uh, was this, um, uh, I'd like to make from, with respect to sort of what we're talking about in terms of cities and climate change um, is this. If you look at sort of this sectoral background, breakdown from this table, uh, many of the uh, costs actually of adaptation, if you know, according to, to the results of the study, will actually fall uh, in cities. I'm out of time. Um, these last slides, which um, you can see, uh, were actually uh, of, of some recent work we've done on um, adaptation issues um, in cities, with particular reference to urban poverty. My last two slides, and if I could, if I could just, if I may, <laughs> just take another 30 seconds actually, will then be to talk about um, financing issues. Um, because then people will always say, well, where's the money? You're the World Bank, so what can we do in just in terms of the money we need um, and, and the investments we need to make? Uh, the message of this slide is there are a number of things uh, or a number of sources of funding. And so I've given some examples here of um, some of these sources um, that the World Bank does work with. Um, but unfortunately, there is less available than is commonly uh, thought. And um, there are sort of each of these um, sources, for example, you know, have their own processes and, and procedures and, and, and so on and so forth. And some of these are morally fully earmarked and, and, and fully allocated. So uh, the last, um, this last slide actually is just to say that we, we did try and uh, address at least some, even some of the sort of the information gaps, if you will, in terms of information availability on what's there. So there was, uh, again, from a couple of years ago, a joint UNDP World Bank effort, uh, and you'll see the URL there, um, to provide through the web uh, or sort of um, some information on what climate finance options there might be. And there's actually a dedicated uh, section on, uh, on which is relevant or, or which is for um, cities. So thanks very much again um, for your attention and I'd be glad to, um, um, to, to pursue some of these uh, discussions and questions with you after this.